A warm welcome to all and a happy summer. Um, I hope wherever you are that it's as beautiful as it is for Gail and me in Massachusetts today. We are having a glorious summer and given that Gail, it's given that we're talking about burnout, it's kind of interesting to have this juxtaposition with the beautiful summer and the idea that one could be burned out <laughs> at this moment in time. And I want to just say a few things about Gail. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through her formal bio because you can all read that. And I, I wanted to share a few things that Gail shared with me, which I think tell you something about um, both depth of character and commitment to people who are struggling. Um, so Gail a volunteered in hospice when she was an undergrad, and that's not typical for um, for someone in their, what, late teens and 20s scale? Yes. To, to sit with people who are dying when you are at a stage of life, when you're barely just getting into the world, and went to medical school in order to work in the hospice field, um, has been um, dedicated to vulnerable populations ever since um, for all of her medical career, um, and got interested in the caregivers of people with Alzheimer's, which is extremely difficult role to play, um, and wrote a book for Harvard Health Publications called Mindfulness Support for Alzheimer's uh, Caregivers. And then more recently has shifted to help physicians, because I guess, Gail, in your time as a doctor, uh, while they're not in hospice and they don't have Alzheimer's, <laughs> they're nevertheless struggling in a way that wasn't the case decades ago. And so uh, Gail's been writing about resilience. Um, she's got a free book called Building a Resilient Self and is now dedicated to working with physicians um, to deal with this growing uh, concern with physician burnout um, and wrote um, one of the first papers on this topic. Um, and Gail, now you actually teach doctors um, resilience training as uh, one of the many ways you contribute to your field. So with that said, over to you, and I'm really looking forward to a, a, a rich and um, invigorating dive into this topic. So thank you for being with us. Thank you, Margaret. It's really a pleasure to be here today, and uh, I really also want to second your welcome to all of our participants from across the North America and other continents as well. So I want to just jump right in. We have a lot to cover, and we do want to leave at least some time for your audience questions as well. Uh, today, my hope is that you will have a, a much deeper understanding of the causes of physician burnout and a heightened awareness of the challenges that physicians face uh, in the current healthcare landscape. We'll also spend a little bit of time on the small body of literature about how to mitigate physician burnout. And uh, for those of you who are coaches in the audience, you will leave with some very specific coaching skills to help physician clients address burnout. So what is burnout? Uh, there's a clinical triad that we think about that includes a loss of enthusiasm for work, really what we think of as an emotional exhaustion, really a flattening sense. We also see um, depersonalization where patients and coworkers and staff become like objects that we perceive we have to navigate through in the course of our day rather than the full human beings that they are. And with that is a sense of cynicism, like why bother, and um, also a sense of callousness. Very importantly, we see a low sense of personal accomplishment. Obviously, physicians are a highly accomplished group, and on any given day, we can well imagine the accomplishments that any physician uh, has. But when one is burnt out, one feels... Uh, a sense of, you know, I'm not accomplishing anything. So there's really an inability to um, identify with your own accomplishments and with your strengths. Certainly, we also see a great deal of imbalance. Physician burnout has been conceptualized in different ways, and I think some of these terms are important just in their poignancy. So Christina Maslach, who's at the um, UC Berkeley and is really the pioneer in the field of burnout in general, talks about erosion of the soul. Uh, Dr. Spickard talks about deterioration of values, dignity, spirit, and will. 
And you can see some of the other quotes here, the silent anguish of the healers, the culture of endurance, and a failure of adaptive reserve. So I think some of these capture the depth of, of how painful it is for physicians and really for other individuals as well when they are experiencing burnout. I want to switch now to uh, evidence that we have that burnout is a very significant problem. And we now have well over 100 studies discussing the problem of burnout and identifying that burnout is a problem in almost every specialty in the United States and then in various countries. We also have literature uh, from a wide variety of countries. This is one of the largest studies that was done, and this study was completed by Dr. Tate Shanafelt and his group at the Mayo Clinic. And they have done really the yeoman's work on uh, physician burnout. So almost all the studies in this country on burnout are published by Dr. Shanafelt or by members of his research group. This study, again, came out in 2012, and it looked at over 7,000 physicians in a wide variety of specialties. And of note, um, it came up with these numbers, which um, when this appeared in the Archives of Internal Medicine in 2012, it made the front page of newspapers across this country because it was such a large study. And because, as you can see, um, we see levels of burnout in the 30 to 60 percent range. Highest in frontline specialties, emergency medicine, general internal medicine, and family medicine. Somewhat lower in pediatrics. Maybe there's a salutary effect of working with the little people. Uh, but what we really see is high levels of burnout. And Margaret and I have discussed this on a number of occasions. There are some problems with how this research is completed. There may be over-reporting of burnout. I, I think nonetheless, um, there's every reason to believe that this is a very real and large problem. And what we see here is a comparison uh, between 2011 and 2014. So the orange bar is 2011. The blue bar is 2014. And as you can see on this slide, there have been significant increases in levels of burnout in a very short period of time, really in a three-year span of time. And this was an article that was just published fairly recently. How do we measure burnout? There are a number of tools, and in the coaching report from the Institute of Coaching this month, uh, there was a wonderful review that many of you may have read that Margaret uh, put together, and that talks about some of these ways of measuring burnout. There's the Maslach Burnout Inventory, which is the gold standard. It's a 22-item measure that looks at those three items that we discussed that make up the clinical triad of burnout. Unfortunately, um, this inventory is only available currently for a fee, uh, and it's available, you can Google it, it's available at a website called mindgarden.com, which Dr. Maslach is a part of. It's not an expensive inventory, I think it's approximately $15 per person, but it is something that you have to pay for. There is also an abbreviated Maslach uh, inventory that was included in the coaching report as a link, so you you can take a look at that. And then there's a two-item measure that's actually used quite extensively in research about burnout, and it looks at the two uh, elements of the triad, emotional exhaustion and depersonalization. And when people rank those as having them at a rate of greater than once a week or more, they are uh, noted to be burnt out. So let's now delve a little bit deeper and look at some of the causes of burnout, and there are many. So let's start with medical training. Obviously, uh, no surprise to anybody in the audience, high personal sacrifice to get into medical school, to live through medical school, to go through residency, perhaps to go through fellowship. Um, I coach a surgical oncologist who had nine years of post-medical school training. Not unusual for someone in a highly specialized field. Medical training is very deficit-based. Uh, if you ask any group of physicians, uh, was your training focused more on your strengths or your weaknesses? There's a big groan in the room, and people raise their hands. It was definitely focused on my weakness. And there is a real lack of positive feedback. So it, people are not being fed uh, information about ways that they're doing well. You know, when we think about the positive psychology approach, not something we see in medical training. 
certainly there's an acculturation process. You become part of a unique and somewhat elite club that has its own language, its own secret handshakes, its own way of talking. So that's an important part of, of, of kind of the expectations of physicians. If you're not perfect, sadly, in medical training, you're not just a little imperfect. You're actually considered a failure. So one can only imagine how erosive that is and how difficult it then becomes for physicians in practice to focus on their strengths. Certainly, the emphasis in medical training is very much on the cognitive. It's really only from the neck up, much less on the body. And, you know, it's, it's kind of comical almost for people whose sole job is caring for the human body. It's really quite a paradox that medical training negates anything having to do with bodily needs. That's a, a very big part of medical training. Uh, the emphasis is also on doing, reacting, now, now, it's a rush, it's, a, it's bordering on an emergency, you have to act. And sadly, there's a lot of shaming. And I, I want to just, I, I don't have a lot of jokes in my presentation, but there's one, and you have to forgive my language here, but there's the old saw, how do you tell the difference between an intern and a piece of shit? Well, nobody goes out of their way to step on a piece of shit, do they? So... It's a horrible joke, um, but it really brings home the point of how much judgment and shaming there is, which leads to a fear of being wrong and really discourages open inquiry. Um, I think it's fair to say in medical training as well that passions are stamped out. You know, this is business here. This is serious, and there's really no time for frivolity. There's no time for other interests, perhaps in the arts, for example. Sadly, there's minimal to no training in human psychology and minimal to no training in self-care or resilience, in how to manage uncertainty, how to manage one's own emotions, all of the things that you see here. And, and in our training, we receive very little, we see very little role modeling about how to care for ourselves, how to put ourselves higher on the list, um, and how to be calm and not reactive in situations. And within the medical profession, there is the hierarchy such that Family practitioners and general internists are looked down upon as being on the low rung, despite having to stay up to date on what I think any physician would say is by far the most broad and deep body of knowledge of any specialty. So at medical schools across the country, students feel ashamed for choosing a primary care field as opposed to taking what is perceived as the prestigious path of becoming a medical specialist. Of course, the ever-lurking fear of malpractice uh, for some physicians, every time they see a patient, they're concerned that they may miss something. And frankly, there are things that can be missed. There's certainly a stigma of weakness, um, a, a stigma about seeking help. Physicians seek medical help and particularly mental health at a considerably lower rate than their non-physician counterparts. I've had physician clients who pay out of pocket, for psychiatry visits and costly antidepressants out of a fear that if they ever had a malpractice case, this would be used against them. And I've also had physician clients in my coaching practice who have very significant mental illness in one or both parents, sometimes in a sibling as well, and who don't pursue psychological or psychiatric therapies, in, again, due to the stigma. The lack of time is a very real issue, um, one that's really hard to get around in the practice of medicine. And I, I think it's important to recognize the seriousness of the endeavor. So I, um, I had a, a client, a family practice physician in, in one of the many states, who had a difficult time playing with his children. And when we looked at that in coaching, it really became clear that play was suspect. Fun was actually suspect because so much of the emphasis from a very early age had been on seriousness. Stay at it. Stick to the books. In terms of time, I think this, this kind of captures it. I spend 50% of my energy on my job, 50% on my spouse or my significant other, and 50% of my kids. I think I see your problem. So the guilt and the sense of inadequacy that physicians feel when they cannot be or cannot show up at 100% for any of the domains in their life. I try to remind my clients, you know, there's only one of you. <laughs> and, and we need to sort of lighten it in that way and help people see, that's right, there is only one of me. 
how can I be expected to show up 100% in all capacities in my life? Many physicians feel that they're doing something bad by working in the evenings, completing their documentation on weekends or on vacations, because it's often interpreted by significant others as somehow caring less about them, caring less about family life, when it's really a plain fact that the job is enormously demanding and has an unrelenting, time-consuming character. Let's look a little bit at personality factors. Again, the sense of perfectionist. Many physicians grew up in households where the theme was, what, you didn't get all A's? <laughs> so that's something that's drilled into physicians from a young age. I think there's another factor here about life passions where if, if a young person excels in school and if they're in a family that values education and professionalism, it's, okay, so are you going to be a doctor or a lawyer? And that individual may want to be a violinist or a choreographer or a pro athlete. And yet those life passions are really stamped out uh, because what's important here in that family of origin, in that system, is achieving in a very circumscribed way. This also a difficulty of setting limits, um, a psychology of postponement, certainly in medical school, well, things will get better when I'm a resident. Then when I'm a resident, oh, things will be better when I'm a fellow. When I'm a fellow, things will be better when I get the right job. So that always postponing uh, gratification. Certainly, life for physicians is often very much determined by external metrics of success. So how did you do in high school? What did you get on the MCAT? How did you do on the boards? And it makes it very difficult for people to have their own internal metric of success. I've had numerous physicians call me, uh, mid-career physicians, people in their 40s and 50s, who will say something to the effect of, you know, Gail, I'm thinking that maybe I should go get my MBA, but I have no interest in business, but I feel like I need to be taking more tests. So that's what physicians are kind of groomed and bred for, and it's important for us to understand that. I think comparisons are really problematic. Uh, as Margaret alluded to, I teach uh, residents a Coaching for Resilience program, and this is for all the internal medicine residents at my hospital, the Brigham and Women's, one of Harvard's main teaching hospitals. And who do you think those residents compare themselves to? Internal medicine residents across the United States? Nope. Their comparison pool is with other Brigham and Women's Hospital internal medicine residents. And these are quite a bright and accomplished group. So we have kind of, you know, the big fish in a small pond and then the small fish in a big pond. And sadly, the comparison is really not a realistic one. Um, so again, some of the other things that you see on this slide, we've, we've touched on a little bit as well. Uh, the exaggerated sense of responsibility, I, I think, is something that really hounds many physicians. Things that are completely out of their control, they may yet feel responsible for. And the imposter syndrome. So this is an underdiagnosed condition that is really rampant among physicians. I gave a talk recently at the American College of Physicians, and I did an audience poll and asked, you know, if people could answer as as um, as uh, honestly as possible whether they walk around feeling like an imposter. And 92% of the physicians in that audience said yes. I walk around feeling like an imposter, that what I know is about the size of a head of a pin, and what other people know is, you know, as big as Lake Ontario. And if I were ever found out, I would be the laughing stock of my institution. So all of these factors have quite an erosive effect on physicians and on their sense of well-being. Physicians are often their harshest self-critics, and I think about this in terms of a couple of clusters of self-critical thoughts. There may be others, uh, but I'll bring a few to your attention. So the first one is, I am not smart enough. It takes various forms. The first that I have listed here, they only let me into medical school because, and some of the ones that I've heard are, because they needed more rural students, because of uh, minority quotas. Um, because it was, it was a bad year and not that many people applied. So this real sense that um, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough. Everybody knows how to study but me. I barely passed my boards. That proves I was never meant to be a physician. 
these are all comments that I hear on a regular basis, and I hear quite, quite a few variations of this as well. Then, something that may come as a surprise to non-physicians in the audience, physicians do not have a lot of confidence. Now, I don't know that this has been well studied, so I, I can't really bear this out in the literature. Um, but what I find for physicians is unrelenting concern about their own ability to make decisions, their own ability to present information to others. So why can't I be decisive like other physicians? I never know if I'm ordering the right tests. I'm never sure enough of myself to articulate my own point of view. People don't often seek my coaching to build confidence, but when we review goals and when we look at the things that they'd like to change in their life and their career moving forward, confidence is often very high on the list. And this is another very important cluster of, of harsh self-criticism, which is I'm not living up to the way I believe a physician should live. And so some examples of that, I don't have the kind of house other docs have. I'm a failure because I don't earn what others make. And then this one is something that a physician said to me. If I were a real doctor, I'd be up at 5 a.m. going to the gym, driving my red Lamborghini to my office where my medical assistant would have my coffee ready for me. No joke. This is something that a physician said to me. So this kind of idealized view of how other physicians are living and that may not be accurate at all. So external factors, and this is where you will hear a lot of physicians um, talking about the woes of medical practice. So the electronic medical record, otherwise known as the EMR or the electronic health record, EHR, we will actually come back to in just a moment. The incredible emphasis on productivity as medicine has become, it's not becoming, as it has become a very, very large business in this country, the emphasis is on the bottom line. How many patients you see, how many x-rays you read, how fast you see patients in an emergency room, these are all metrics that physicians have to live with and dance to in the current healthcare environment. There's also an increasing administrative burden, a lot of tasks that one might call kind of below grade or below level of expertise that have been added to the physician's plate. You're probably aware that we're in the midst of a very large physician shortage that is predicted to grow at a very rapid rate, particularly as the population ages. So you have physicians who it's summer, their summer vacation, but all that means is that everybody else has to suck it up and, and take on more shifts. The last point here I think is really quite important, that as medicine has become a business, uh, there are many more layers of managerial people involved. And who are these individuals? These individuals are typically non-physicians. Many of them are nurses, many are non-nurses. And so the role and the responsibilities of physicians are increasingly dictated by non-physicians. And physicians are not used to that. Physicians are used to just dictating their own lives and how they're going to practice. And now they're being told, well, not only do you have to see X number of patients, but, you know, by the way, we're taking away two of your exam rooms because we just don't have enough room for all the specialties. Um, a dermatologist uh, told me that um, because of so much turnover of staffing in her, in her group practice, nobody was keeping up with ordering specialized supplies. And it got to the point where all she had were band-aids and gauze to take care of extremely complicated wound management cases. So she began to feel like she was practicing in a third world country and it was completely out of her control. When she tried to talk to the non-physician administrator about that, um, she was actually told that she was a complainer and that she should be quiet. So this, again, uh, I don't mean to be overly grim. I'm really trying to be as accurate as possible about the challenges that physicians are facing and, and the sense of devaluation as well, sense that um, I'm just a widget. You know, they can really bring somebody else in. They don't really care who I am. They don't care what I'm doing for patients. They really just care about the bottom line. So now let's talk about the EMR, um, which has really become a lightning rod of um, kind of the discontent and the disgruntlement that physicians are feeling. There's a study that is so new, it's actually not even available online. I just got an alert about it, again, by Dr. Shanafelt, excuse me, at the Mayo Clinic, 
where he found that physicians were spending more than 10 hours a week, more than 10 hours a week uh, working on the electronic medical record after hours. So nights, weekends, when they might have that time off, uh, they're faced with documentation. And I, I can say that myself for physicians in my coaching practice. One physician said to me, you know, I haven't gone out to dinner um, with my boyfriend in three months because that would mean getting really behind on my documentation. We're also seeing what it's very fair to say are subpar software systems. Steve Stack, the president of the American Medical Association, has compared most EMRs to Ataris from the 1980s. And, you know, we, we can really lament that that's not the kind of software that we want our physicians to be using. For anybody who has been a patient or who has a loved one who's been a patient, uh, you know that the EMR is quite a barrier to the physician being present with you. And that's not only upsetting to the patient, it's deeply disturbing to the physician, who really, in their heart of hearts, wants to be fully present for patients, and yet has to deal with this machine that is often very problematic to use. Uh, physicians also historically took a lot of pride in their notes. So you see a patient, you know, it is a medical legal requirement that you write a note and you document what transpired. Many physicians consider the node a showcase of their ability to process information and put together all the information that that patient is bringing to them, the laboratory data, the imaging, the past records, etc., and to actually come up with a coherent diagnosis. So the note was really an outline of your thought process and something that you could take a lot of pride in. The note was also a way of telling a story about a beloved patient's life. The note was also kind of a warm handoff to other physicians or, or nurse practitioners who might pick up that patient or see the patient in another setting. And it was something like a warm handoff. You know, this is a patient that I care about and I want to tell you about them and here's my note and that's my way of doing it. And now physicians are pushed to write bullet notes and keep notes very short so that they can be more efficient with their time. Computer aversion. Uh, I've had uh, clients talk about being nauseated when they face the computer. It's kind of like getting chemotherapy, what we call anticipatory nausea, when, uh, when a patient actually goes by the hospital or the clinic where they got chemotherapy two years later and have to go back for another dose. The never empty EMR inbox, labs, callbacks, prescription requests, authorizations for tests, it's like a cluttered desk. But no matter how many times you declutter, the mess just reappears almost instantaneously. So I think this is another source um, of really a very real lamentation for physicians. Many physicians, when they log on, have a dashboard that instead of cheering them on and saying, hey, you know, great to see you, I know you're going to have a really good session with your patients, that dashboard lists, you know, the 200 charts that they're behind on and the 176 items that are currently outstanding in their inbox. There's also public reporting of, um, of many metrics, which include physician uh, patient satisfaction, Obviously, patient satisfaction could not be more important. It's enormously important. But when you look at some of the tools that are being used to measure patient satisfaction, you realize that there are many things that are out of the patient's control. Patients being left in a waiting room because a medical assistant actually didn't bring them in, even though the physician was ready to see them. That's just one example. Um, and just a quote from a physician, when I'm on call, I have to cover three hospitals. I'm at one of them. I'm so infrequently that my password typically expires without my even knowing it. I was there last weekend and I couldn't put in orders and the nurse was screaming at me to get the orders in. When I called IT, no one answered. And when I told my supervisor, I was written up for complaining. So sadly, this is not uncommon in terms of what physicians are facing. And then you may be wondering about this last item, ZDog MD. So you'll have to Google this. He is a hospitalist who is also a rapper. He is quite an entertaining physician. And he has a wonderful video about the MR. So it's about three and a half minutes long. It's time well spent. And one quote from that is that the EMR is an elevated billing platform with patient information tacked on. And this is really the life of, of physicians, having to interact with something that really is an elevated billing platform. 
So just to finish up with the external factors, uh, some of you may be familiar with the term VUCA. It, it, this is something that came to us in the military. It's frequently used in the corporate world to sum up the volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and chaos, and ambiguity that we see in the modern healthcare environment. So, you know, sometimes this may sound like a joke, but there'll be a physician who goes to, on vacation on a Friday and they're employed by healthcare system X. They come back to work a week from Monday. They've been away for a week and now they're employed by healthcare system Y, who was previously their largest competitor. So this kind of volatility and uncertainty and the, and the chaos, what I, the example that I gave about the dermatology, the chaos that physicians have to struggle with. We see heightened scrutiny and accountability, much of which is critically important, but again, it's an added burden on physicians. Um, I think I've covered some of the other things. The last one that I wanted to touch on in this slide is physicians being pushed to the bounds of ethical behavior. So as medicine becomes and is more and more about the bottom line, there are significant non-clinical ethical quandaries that almost every specialty faces. In my field, hospice medicine, hospices are paid on a daily rate for patients. So I and, and other hospice physicians are often pushed to enroll patients who are actually not terminally ill. <laughs> this is a problem. This is Medicare fraud. One can go to jail for this. One can lose one's license for this. And yet for the administrators in hospice, by and large, I'm making a generalization here, their job is to bring in more dollars. So who's the gatekeeper? The gatekeeper is the doctor. I've had surgeons tell me that they're pushed to operate in understaffed ORs, anesthesiologists who are supervising CRNAs in multiple ORs at opposite ends of a football-sized OR campus. So, you know, these are things that are really testing physicians. And I just want to read this quote. Um, this is by Lucian Leap, who's really the granddaddy of patient safety. This absence of joy and meaning experienced by much of the healthcare workforce is, is in part due to psychological and physical harm. And I'm sorry, I can't quite read the right part of my own slide because of the screen here, so you might have to read this yourselves. But he goes on to talk about the physical harm that people in healthcare face, the psychological harm in the complex environment of the healthcare workplace, egregious examples including intimidation and physical assault, and psychological harm due to lack of respect. This dysfunction is compounded by production concerns and poor design of workflow. He goes on to say, sadly, complex, intimate caregiving relationships have been reduced to a series of transactional demanding tasks with a focus on productivity and efficiency fueled by the pressures of decreasing reimbursement. So at a very minimum, it's fair to say that the squeeze is on for physicians. There are huge factors that are rapidly changing and do not show signs of letting up that leave physicians, again, at a minimum, with a huge distraction from the actual care of patients. So all of these things that have to be attended to and dealt with are going on for the physician simultaneously as that individual physician is attempting to take the best possible care of patients. So we really have a perfect storm here, and if you saw Margaret's uh, wonderful write-up in, in the coaching report in July, she talks about Christina Maslach's six domains that contribute to burnout, and much of these are all too true for physicians. Too much work and inadequate resources, lack of uh, control. I think in the next one, obviously physicians are well rewarded financially, although physicians don't always see that, but certainly too little recognition for the job that they're doing for the strengths that they have. Interpersonal difficulties in terms of challenges around respect and conflict, a feeling that there's a lack of fairness, and then conflicts as we touched on around those ethics examples, conflicts regarding values. So a perfect storm for really setting us up for what people talk about as a occupational health problem, this epidemic of physician burnout.
I want to just touch briefly on um, something that Sonia Leubermirsky refers to as the myths of happiness and how that shows up for physicians. Well, everything would be fine if I had a more manageable workload. If I were a retinologist or a neurosurgeon, then I'd be rich, so I'd be a success. And if I didn't have to deal with that blank EMR, then I'd be happy. If they'd just leave me alone and let me see my patients, yeah, I, everything would be okay then. And if I didn't have all these non-physician administrators trying to dictate the practice of medicine, then I'd be happy. And sadly, this adds up to, for many physicians, I can't be happy, given the current stresses in healthcare. So I want to shift here um, we have all these studies about burnout. Luckily, the research dollars are beginning to shift to look at, well, what can we do about this? We've identified that there's a problem. How can we begin to heal this and shift this? So the American Medical Association has a program, Steps Forward. I would encourage you to look at that. That talks a lot about um, workplace practice management and what can be done to shift a lot of the non-clinical duties from the physician where they're currently landing to non-physicians. So something called scribes where there's somebody um, actually taking notes as the patient is talking and then inputting that as a skeleton for a note that the doctor can use so this doctor doesn't have to sit and type as they're talking. There are a number of other workflow interventions that could be made that are exceedingly important to manage what many consider an unsustainable pattern of workload for physicians. What we're focusing on here more is what do we do kind of in terms of the internal milieu? How do we help physicians cope with um, the, the daunting external challenges that they're facing? So this is a, an important paper that came out, again, by Dr. Shanafelt. This is really his area, and he, he's brought us uh, much, uh, much in terms of contributions. This came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2009, a prescription for preventing burnout and for promoting having the patient being at the center of care. And a kind of a summary of what he wrote is really that physicians need to know how they operate, what pushes their buttons. <laughs> they need to go deep within themselves and become more self-aware. Notice what's going on in the environment and noticing how they react to it. So becoming aware that they actually have choices, um, how can they move away from automatic responses and reactivity, Dr. Shanafelt also touched on engagement, which is something that Christina Maslach has, has touted uh, all along in her research. We also need to help physicians focus on their strengths, and we need to focus on mindfulness. And I want to just touch on mindfulness here, and, and in a moment we'll open it up to some initial questions. Mindfulness was first written about in a medical journal almost 20 years ago. Ron Epstein at the University of Rochester wrote this wonderful treatise in, um, in JAMA. And mindfulness is being increasingly looked at uh, as something that we can use to mitigate and uh, prevent levels of physician burnout. So in the very small body of literature that we have about what to do about uh, burnout, and it is a very small literature, we now have over half a dozen studies about the use of mindfulness. This is one example. This is from um, Dr. Krasner and his colleagues also at the University of Rochester that used a program that people in the audience may have heard of, the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program, which is an intensive program. It's not something that all physicians can embark on. It's um, over 30 hours of training over, an, uh, excuse me, about 30 hours of training over an eight-week period and really teaches people all the aspects of mindfulness. So we now have numerous studies that actually show that when physicians complete these programs and then have follow-up uh, around how to continue mindfulness practices, there is a decrement in the level of burnout. And just briefly, uh, many of you know what mindfulness is, but just in case you don't, John Kabat-Zinn, who's a, a researcher for many years at UMass Memorial Medical School and has really been a pioneer in bringing mindfulness into North American culture, talks about mindfulness being paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and without judgment. 
And whenever I get to the slide and I teach physicians this and I get to that phrase, the present moment, I can see the eye rolling. And for a lot of physicians, this is um, kind of a hard pill to swallow. Um, and I deconstruct this in my own way that present moment is about living in the reality of your present circumstances. It's living with the reality of whatever is going on for you in any given moment of your life and doing so with compassion for yourself and for others. And again, this is a tall order for physicians. Physicians are constantly worrying about outcomes. Did I do the right thing? What if the patient has an adverse reaction to a medication that I prescribed? Should I have sent that person to the hospital and not sent them home? What if something bad happens? What if there's a complication to the surgical procedure that I just did? So while we know about the importance of mindfulness, again, it, it's a tall order for physicians. So I want to have an opportunity now before we shift to the, uh, the very important part of the talk about how coaching can help this problem, we want to have an opportunity for some of your questions. Margaret, do you have some questions at this yes. time? Gail, we do. Yes, thank you for uh, checking in and for a great job so far. And actually, uh, Debbie Laxer sends you the message that she's loving this presentation. So oh, thank nice. you. That's, that's wonderful to hear about my accomplishment. That's going to keep me going for the second right, part exactly. of our, of our yeah. presentation. Everybody needs the affirmation. So um, uh, the first question is from Lawrence, and it is... Um, asking for a comment on the concept of physicians feeling as victims. Wonder what you might want to say about that. Yeah, I think, again, I, I hope that what I've shared so far helps illustrate the extraordinary demands that physicians are facing. I think if we step back, as we often do in coaching, and look at different perspectives, we can see that many sectors of the economy have been pushed. It's not just physicians. Look at attorneys. Look at bankers. Look at people in blue-collar jobs. The, the, what is exacted from people in the workforce is enormous. And I think it's important for physicians to actually keep that perspective, that they are facing daunting circumstances, things that are really getting in the way of taking care of patients very real and there's a both and an and here so that is both going on and we need to help physicians create tools for how to cope with very challenging external circumstances and again challenging external circumstances are a part of life they are a part of life and, and, and I can't emphasize strongly enough that they're a part of the lives of many people in the healthcare equation for nurses, for home health aides, you know, the, these are pressures that people are facing in, in all aspects of healthcare. So I would say it's a both and. There may be a sense of being a victim. I, I think there's a bigger picture than that. Great. So let me carry on and we've got quite a few here. I'm going to build on what Debbie asks about patients using the Internet to self-diagnose and add to that something that came out of our webinar in March where we were talking about physicians learning coaching skills. And the reason for that is that they want to improve their impact on their patients' engagement in taking good care of their health. So basically, these are the patient issues, either you know coming to their own independent kind of diagnoses or not really engaging in what's good for their health. So how does that factor into this, all the different you know, causes of um, physician burnout today? Bill? Thank you so much for bringing that up. This is very critical, the burgeoning technologies that no physician can keep up with. So patients coming in you know, with this URL and this printout, and the physician may not even be aware of this information. So that is an incredible demand and leaves physicians, again, sometimes feeling like I'm an imposter. I don't know, you know everything that's to be known in my field when really it's impossible to do so. So I, I think that's very critical. This is where I think wellness coaching is critically important. You know, we have an, a, an epidemic of obesity. 
we have problems with smoking, we have alcoholism, we have overuse of prescription drugs, we have so many things that we don't have answers for. I mean, that's, that's a very, very, very short list. So physicians are faced with all of these complex issues, issues that may be a result of socioeconomic factors that are obviously completely out of the control of the physician. I think the more that physicians can engage wellness coaches, I think when physicians learn motivational interviewing techniques, when they can truly partner with a patient, not see the patient as kind of the, the object that has to be treated, when they can actually partner and begin to elicit the patient's goals more, kind of really a coaching approach to patient care that's the embodiment of, of wellness coaching, it shifts. The sense of the over-exaggeration of personal responsibility shifts to a more appropriate understanding of, you know, there's only so much I can do here. And I can take this patient with obesity and I can provide knowledge, but I can't change the patient's behaviors. <laughs> so that's very important because many, many physicians feel crushed by the enormity of um, patient conditions that they actually can't effect change in. Yes, very good. So let's do one last one, and I'm pulling together two or three in one question. So this has to do with the environment that physicians find themselves. So the shift to new business kinds of structure in terms of reimbursement, the shift to the team approach, bringing on you know, nurse practitioners and other staff, and the shift to the demand for uh, in fact, those of you who saw Michael Ye, who presented at last year's coaching conference, he's a surgeon, and he talked about the need for physicians to become leaders as part of the skill set that they didn't. So the leadership, the, the economic and business drivers, and this team approach, those are all things that, that I understand are not really taught in medical school. How is that adding to this, this burden for docs? I think it really is part of the complexity in that VUCA equation that um, doctors are not taught a lot of the skills that they need to function really probably in days of old and in the current healthcare environment. So certainly around teamwork, uh, physicians are taught very little about how to work with other members of the healthcare team, critically important members of the healthcare team. The business models where incentives can be extremely skewed, you know, again, skewed around how many x-rays a radiologist sits in a dark room and reads in an hour as opposed to really the quality of patient care. So we do see a lot of quality metrics as well. I think many physicians and physician um, leaders would say that those quality measures are new and highly imperfect and often penalize doctors uh, for actually doing the right thing. So thank you um, for, for pulling those questions together because th these are all very real issues. Well, good. I'm, I, there's a number of questions about coaching, and I think that's part of your next phase. So perhaps you should go get back into it, and then we'll come back to the other questions later. Yes. So I, I want to just say, as, as we kind of move into this next part about how coaching helps, Again, I in no way mean to minimize, I, I really hope it's not coming across as minimizing the remarkable demands that physicians are facing. And we applaud all efforts that are being done in, in many quarters and support increasing efforts to kind of right the ship and, and um, decrease the, the tasks that physicians don't need to be spending their time doing. It's, it's critically important. What we're often looking at as coaches and what some of the literature that we're seeing about how to handle physician burnout points to is how physicians kind of manage themselves. So, it, you know, it's a, it's a blending of a lot of different specialties. So when we think about coaching, there are a couple of reasons why we know that coaching can help physicians and we don't have literature about coaching in the medical profession. The paper that I wrote that Margaret mentioned that uh, appeared in the Journal of General Internal Medicine in 2015 is a narrative piece. It's not a research piece. So we, we don't really know how coaching will help physicians, but hopefully that's data that we can begin accruing. Why can coaching help physicians? Well, obviously coaching is deeply focused on the client's strengths. 
Uh, it's about challenging assumptions about oneself, about one's circumstances, and how one interacts with them. It's about looking at self-critical patterns. So these are all things that are contributing to the burnout, the lack of sense of strength and accomplishment, all of those assumptions about oneself and, oh, this workplace is just miserable, I'm never going to be able to survive it. So challenging that in, in ways that we will get to. Physicians love aha moments. Physicians are, are love to learn. So coaching is, is a journey of self-discovery and learning, and we harness that, that love that physicians have. And then the tremendous goal orientation that physicians have. They want to achieve. They like setting goals and checking them off. So we're, we're all about setting goals as coaches. Being a non-judgmental ally, this is so critical. As I, as I pointed out, physicians are used to being judged, and they're used to be being judged and coming up short. So coaches who, by definition, are a non-judgmental ally, we believe in the ability of our clients to, to affect change in their lives. And we are in a partnership. It's the opposite of the traditional medical model that's hierarchical. We go in for an equal partnership where if anybody's the expert, it's the physician who is the expert on their life. And physicians have very few opportunities to actually reflect about their own lives, so it can be very exciting for them and somewhat invigorating, painful at times, uh, but to really have somebody where they can talk about what, what's deeply important. Obviously, in coaching, we're always talking about results. It's all about moving forward, deepening the knowledge, and forwarding the action. So the focus on results and accountability is one that's very familiar for physicians, and then certainly as we look forward, more than we look past as it looks to the past as coaches. So again, this is the paper that I wrote, and the central premise of this paper uh, that I co-authored with Dr. Liebschutz and Dr. Reese is that coaching can help affirm, establish the internal locus of control. And this is critically important, you know, as the questions come in uh, about all of the external demands and the pressures that physicians are facing. And again, if you look to a group of physicians and you ask them, why are you burnt out? They're not going to really talk about their training. They're not going to talk about perfectionism. They'll talk about the electronic health record. They'll talk about productivity. They'll talk about these blank, you know, non-physician administrators. So what we're focusing on here is something very different. What are the things you can control in a situation that may seem out of control? And I think coming back to Viktor Frankl, his quotes are often used. I, I think they're critically important. Everything can be taken from a person, but one thing, the last of their human freedoms, to choose their attitude in any given circumstances, to choose one's own way. And this is obviously a core premise of the coaching endeavor. We, we want to try to change external circumstances, and we want to help our clients do that if that's what they set forth to do. When they can't change external circumstances, there are still many things that they can do to find meaning, purpose, happiness, joy. So let's talk about a couple of specific coaching techniques. So as I described, and as many of you are well aware, that deficit-based model. We in coaching focus more on strengths and accomplishments, and we counter what physicians are used to, which is close-ended, factual questions that include a judgment or lead the physician to believe that they are about to be judged. So an example, a physician might say, I'm so beaten down. I'm not accomplishing anything. It's a very common lamentation. I'm not accomplishing anything. So we might counter that with our open-ended, thought-provoking questions to the, to the effect of, well, what are you accomplishing? What's going well here? You've mentioned numerous ways that you're not doing well and that you're not accomplishing things. Give me some examples of things that are going well. And specifically, can you focus now, client, on three things that you've accomplished this past week, that you've accomplished yesterday as you saw patients? And I'll sit there with clients, and they'll go from, I'm not accomplishing anything, to, well, I guess now that you mention it, you know, when I sat with that patient with congestive heart failure, I really was able to make some changes in her medications. You know, I can't cure her CHF, but... I, I think I improved her quality of life, and I'll go 
bingo, you know, that's great, I, and, and really help the client to see this accomplishment that they, they actually just glossed over because their focus was on I'm not accomplishing anything. Um, some other, you know, and these are questions, obviously we go deeper than asking questions as coaches, but these are kind of questions to open the door from uh, an, an expression of something like I'm not accomplishing anything or I'm not smart enough. Um, how can you apply the strengths that you so clearly demonstrated in that situation that you told me about to the challenge that you're facing today? Clients saying things like, I don't know what to do. I, maybe I have to retire. I'm only 46 and I've got three kids in college, but I, I'm desperate. I don't know what I should do. And to come back and say something like, you know, you said you don't know what you should do, but I'm getting the sense that you do know something about what you should do. Let's start there. So again, to help that client build the sense of efficacy that they naturally have, tapping into that. So that's, that's critically important. Uh, a second technique uh, it revolves around helping physicians regain a sense of meaning and countering that, that deeply painful depersonalization that can go on in burnout. So a hospitalist client said this to me not that long ago, they're all so sick. All we do is put on Band-Aids, send them out of the hospital, and await their return when the Band-Aids fall off. So there's just this deep sense of sadness, and they're all so sick. You know, they're just kind of these objects we put Band-Aids on. And a response might be, I hear your anguish. So very important to acknowledge the suffering. If it's okay with you, asking permission, if it's okay with you, can you tell me about a patient, three patients, where you made a difference in their lives? And when I posed that question again, when this physician could see the bright light shining on these individual patients where, where they were making a difference, all of a sudden that initial statement began to lose some of its um, steam, that sense, we don't do anything. I don't do anything. I have no sense of efficacy or meaning here. So coming back to what aspects of your work provide the most meaning for you, the vast majority of physicians will answer that by saying it's being with patients. Even if I can't fix whatever it is that they're suffering from, even if we don't have a cure for their advanced cancer, my presence with them is deeply important to them. And you know what? It's really satisfying for me to be able to be there for them. So helping physicians remind themselves about, well, where is the meaning? Because when we look from the outside, I find myself thinking this many times, even though I'm a physician myself, that non-physicians must look at physicians and think, well, you have so much meaning. You're, you know, you're helping fellow human beings day in, day out. Can't you see that? And yet many physicians are not seeing it. That's a hallmark of burnout. So we want to keep shining a light on where the meaning is to, to help that physician develop kind of new ways of seeing their day. Pulling on a best reflected self, a best possible self is really critical. All physicians want to be at their best. That has tremendous meaning for them. So if you can get a physician to embody a time when they were at their best, let's say a time in the last week, you know, client, can you tell me about a time when you were at your best? And you get them to really re-experience that moment, to relive it mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, if that's relevant, to relive that moment of who they are when they're at their best. You get them to walk around really embodying it in, in, in a physical way. And you ask a little bit, so who is that Dr. X client? You know, who, who are you when you're at your best? And from that place, ask them to brainstorm about measures they can take in their daily life, ways that they can affect change here and now. So certainly at the heart of the coaching endeavor is the ability to help clients challenge assumptions about themselves, about their circumstances, about their relationships in their lives, and help them elicit new perspectives. So another quote, it's all so miserable. I can't stand another day at work. It's just one big mess. So some questions to help elicit new perspectives. What assumptions are you living with here, client? How resourceful are you here? What's the opposite perspective from how you're seeing this problem now? 
And then the next question, which honestly, I, I think if, if there are coaches in the audience who are not using this question, I would up this on your list of thought-provoking, powerful questions. What would you gain, client, if you experienced less negativity around your work? So I, I sometimes joke with clients, you know, let's pretend it's Monday and you're going back to work, and let's just call it Magic Monday. And when you go to work on Magic Monday, you're actually feeling less negative. You're able to see the positive a little bit more in what's going on around you. You're, you're a little happier seeing patients. You notice things that you wouldn't have noticed before. So client, if, if you can picture that, and I want you to close your eyes because this is a bit of a fantasy journey, and tell me now, when you picture yourself on Magic Monday, what would you gain? And almost uniformly, my physician clients say things like, well, there'd be a lightness in my step. I think my mood would be better. You know, I don't think I'd be as irritable with my nurse. I'd be more productive. You know, I actually think I'd get more charts done. I'd sleep better. <laughs> so I, I'm being very serious with you. I, I use this question a lot, and I use it in groups when I do this in a, in a teaching forum with, with um, large groups of physicians. Physicians can readily see what they would gain if they were able to shed some of their personal negativity. So same circumstances, no change in the external demands, no change in the patient population, and yet a shift in their own perspective that can be very fruitful for them. Certainly, how are you using this to grow or how are you using this to beat yourself up? A, a key coaching question. Certainly, we want to help physicians challenge these hosts and clusters of self-critical beliefs that we touched on earlier. So a physician who, you know, keeps coming back to, I've never been smart enough. I've never had what it takes to be a doctor. You know, my parents thought this was the way to go, but I've never had what it takes. I'm, I'm never going to be good at this. So really challenging the, that client, what is factual about this belief and what is not? Using that technique of rapid-fire self-disputation. Okay, client, you just made this self-critical thought. I want you rapidly to give me three counter-arguments. So helping the physician mobilize their own defenses so that they can build that internal muscle of challenging their own belief system. Um, so that, that's included on the slide. Envisioning. Thinking about the future. How would you like things to be? Again, clients, I can't wave a magic wand and change the way you're paid and how many patients uh, you're required to see. Even with those external circumstances, how would you like to be feeling in your workplace? Tell me what that would be like and picture that. What's the cost to you of living the way you currently are? Again, helping that client deepen their awareness of how they're living and ways that it, helping them to begin to see options for change. What would you gain, again, if you resolve the current challenge? If you can picture yourself, client, six months in the future with this challenge overcome, tell me what your experience would be like. We don't know how you're going to meet this challenge. That's a story that has yet to unfold. I want you to just take a leap of faith and picture six months in the future that you have overcome this challenge and you're happy about how you've done that. You're happy about how you faced your circumstances. But help me. I really want you to pretend that it's six months in the future. Tell me what that experience is like. And then coming back to this very important body of literature about mindfulness, helping physicians move out of the cognitive arena to the fullness of their lived experience, the emotional the physical, in addition to the cognitive, as, as I mentioned, reinforcing a both and as opposed to an either or conceptualization. So both and, yes, these circumstances are mightily difficult and I can find ways to be happy and to, to sort of re-equilibrate so that I can still see the meaning in what I do. And another obviously critical part of mindfulness is moving from judgment to compassion. So some of the, the questions that you might ask, um, again, embody that moment right now and tell me what you're experiencing mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, helping the physician get reconnected to a body that they've learned how to disconnect from. What would you gain if you were able to accept things just as they are? If you were a beginner in this situation, how might it look to you? How would curiosity Expand your view of your current circumstances. Then bringing in gratitude and self-compassion. 
What aspects of your life are you grateful for? I hear you beating yourself up, client. Can you tell me two self-compassionate ways that you could view yourself to replace that current viewpoint? And then, the, again, the challenge of the either-or. And I, I, I want to just say I've really had to work with myself as a physician to whenever I'm tempted to say or and either, I've had to really train myself to say and. So that might be something to try out with clients when you're thinking of saying either this or that, switching it to both and. And then the importance of basic coaching techniques, articulating what's going on, acknowledging the successes that a client has, championing them, celebrating successes. So articulating what's going on. I can see how troubling this is for you. Acknowledging, I see your courage and your fortitude just getting up every day and facing what you've told me. How you are approaching this is inspirational for me. And I sense that this is a big win for you, and it could be something really small, and yet for the physician to affect this change, we want to acknowledge that that's a big thing. What can you do to celebrate this? What can we do in the session? Is there an image, is there a metaphor that comes to mind that can really exemplify what a big win this was for you? And again, this is our role as a non-judgmental ally believing that the physician can find a way to survive and even thrive. And you'll notice, too, I, I don't say things like, I'm so proud of you, client. That, that's about me. That's not about them. These are, these are statements that acknowledge their strengths and helping to name them and mirror them back to, to the client. Creating structure and accountability critical in the coaching endeavor. What small action will you take today to move towards your goal? around the guilt that physicians feel that leads to as one major contributor to the emotional exhaustion. Will you let yourself off the hook for at least one thing every day this week? And the client, you know, you give them the option, yes, no, or negotiate. The client says yes. Well, how are you going to make sure that happens? So you come back with, so client, will you populate your calendar with it so you actually remember? Every night, will you make a list of three things that you accomplished that day? So the three good things exercise, gratitude, accomplishment, you know, you can be used for a variety of things. When you go to work tomorrow and your focus is on what's going wrong, will you challenge yourself to look for at least one positive thing in each clinical session? And then however you use accountability with your clients, but obviously it's critically important that you do use it, how will I know? that you move forward on your steps. If it's the summertime and it's going to be three weeks until we meet, will you send me an email every Friday so that I can be updated and I can help you as your accountability partner? So, Margaret, we have some time for um, questions. I'm sorry, just before that, I, I encourage all of you, this is my small contribution, Building Your Resilient Self, 52 Tips to Move from Physician Burnout to Balance. This is a free uh, downloadable PDF on my site, so it's, um, I encourage you to, to take advantage of this and to use this. So, your questions. I'll give you the sort of two themes that are coming out from many questions, and there are too many questions to tell to, to go through them all, but they do fall into two themes. One is one theme is how do you get both the physicians engaged in coaching and then second their organizations. So that's the question around how do you help them see they are burned out, that they need help or that they would benefit from help. And then how do you help them see that a coach would be the way forward and then in the organizational context, how do you get the organization on board with even going beyond a pilot to a larger program? So that's part one. And then part two is to what extent is there a need for additional education? You know, you talk about how the basic, how far behind physicians are compared to, say, other business sectors because they've got their heads down and are not aware, you know, of these, the, these concepts around working with strengths and meaning and and mindfulness and self-compassion. So those are the two questions. How do you actually get the doctors interested, help them see burnout, and then their organizational interest, and make time for coaching? And then do they also need education? Well, let me start with the second one. And th these are critically important questions. 
recently I was working with the Brigham residents. I work with them in small groups. And um, one of the residents turned to me kind of angrily, and she said, you know, every week something gets added to our plate. Now we have to learn how to be resilient. <laughs> so we're really playing catch up here. If these skills around building resilience, coping, dealing with uncertainty, managing, delivering difficult news, feeling um, that, that your own weakness wouldn't be stigmatized and used against you, if these were embodied in medical school and then in, in residency and fellowship training, I don't think we would be having quite the problem that we're having. I think we would still be facing demanding and, and increasing pressures, but physicians would at least have some skills, which you would think would be part of medical training and really need to be. So there is no question that these things need to be added early on in the medical training process. In terms of getting physicians on board, Sadly, I would say I have many clients and prospective clients who say, you know, I'm not sure. Maybe I need therapy. You know, I'm deeply unhappy. My husband says I need therapy or, you know, somebody says I need therapy. So I think that people are used to reaching for therapy. And um, even though the stigma is there, it, it's at least a known entity. And coaching is not known to the rank and file of physicians. It's increasingly known in the C-suite, but it's not known to frontline physicians. So we have work to do. And I think things, obviously, like the Institute of Coaching and this webinar are evidence that this work is, is underway. How to get organizations on board, um, that is not a one-size-fits-all. There are some organizations that are so strapped for cash, they're not going to put any money into anything. There are some organizations that I know of that are working wonderfully, have leadership that is deeply invested in helping the physician workforce. Are these the majority of health organizations? I don't know. Probably not, but they are out there. So, um, again, in the AMA Steps Forward program, they do give some examples of, of um, organizations that are working to build physician resilience. I think we have a long way to go. I think this needs to become part and parcel of um, any healthcare organization, whether it's a hospital or a group practice. There needs to be wellness efforts of, of many sorts. Yeah, so Gail, I think where you were coming from today was very much about the positive psychology informed, strengths based, mm -hmm. um, and mindfulness and meaning and autonomy. So it sounds as though, you know, those are the areas that you lean on a great deal. Without a doubt. And uh, whether I'm coaching a client with burnout or coaching a client who's working on conflict management or leadership development, I, I, I personally have found that those skills are extremely helpful. But, but certainly, you know, just as a summary statement, when, you, when you're thinking about burnout, I think going back to that definition and really thinking about how can I as a coach or if you're a physician in need, um, how can I use these things to reverse these patterns that I find myself in at a time when the practice of medicine is exceedingly complex and I, I'm really facing very harsh circumstances? What is it that I can do to shift how it is that I'm interacting with myself and with the world around me? I think what really comes home from what you've said, I'm sure everybody can see this, that, that when people are in the workplace, when it isn't really just dealing about workplace issues, it's really about dealing with their whole perspective around themselves and what their relationship to their own work and their own health and well-being. And I think that's what you really, really put across beautifully today, that kind of whole person well-being is what counts. And wouldn't it be amazing if we all collectively as a community could move the needle here with physicians because I think it would, would help with the workplace of healthcare and it would help with the way we treat patients as whole people as well. Without a doubt. Yes, thank you for, for coming full circle to that. Absolutely critical. Great, good. Well, now we're three minutes over and I just want to appreciate everybody's time, including yours, Gail. So, Thanks from all of us for a beautiful presentation, incredibly detailed and rich. You're sharing your own insights and wisdom. I hope this grows and flourishes as an area for great coaches, of which there are many with us today, can really make a difference. So thank you for being here, for your beautiful work and your ongoing contribution and inspiration to us all. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret. Really a pleasure.